flight zone is for immediate... Wait a minute. Have you heard... This is a show to keep you on the edge of your seat. Citizens of America, welcome to the RadioCast. Hello and welcome to another episode of RadioCast. This is a podcast that we started uh, with the ECAT crew to really go a deeper cut dive for the two shows that we brought back, Old Time Movie and Old Time TV. So uh, today's show is going to be the back end of the Old Time TV show, and that episode was the Dick Van Dyke episodes. It's the episode I hosted, and then today our panel is an addition from last time radio cast, but uh, we have Ben Bradford that you kind of know from the last Old Time movie and making his way through the circuit. Uh, one of the new added to the panel is a face that people should know and probably recognize with the fiery red hair, but uh, one of the many faces of Easton News and slowly became the voice of away sports. <laughs> happened with soccer and fall sports and really basketball. And I think that was it. No, we've always had, had hockey. But yeah, it's yeah. mainly basketball. I that. struggle with the soccer. Soccer is where I struggle. Yeah. <laughs> And we, which is Jack Ryan for you folks that don't know who he is. Um, and then we also have Jack Kelleher, the other Jack here walking around the studios, is back on this panel. And then our producer is Joe Taff, our sports uh, anchor, I guess you would say. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, another person that you'll see his face in the circuit of this little adventure that we kind of through as a, uh, a suggestion to start redoing the shows and we're kind of taking this and really running with it, starting our own podcast and that and choosing what we want to do. So uh, if you're not familiar with the show, uh, it's uh, an old show that used to be on ECAT and it fell dormant, um, but it would take shows that are in public domain and kind of show uh, different episodes of it. Um, either different themes or a full um, series. So like this past episode, we did all the, ep- well, it's some of the episodes that were in public domain for the Dick Van Dyke show. So uh, we did, I think there's six episodes that are in public domain, but we did uh, The Night the Roof Fell In, Hustling the Hustler, Name Never Name a Duck, and Bank Book 6565696. Uh, but the other two episodes are also a man. Uh, a man's teeth is not his own, and give me your walls are the other two episodes that just didn't make um, public domain. Which is kind of one that, if you look up, there was really no backstory. It just seems like no one was on the ball getting it done. It just got I, left I out of the I mixture. I didn't know those weren't in the public domain. I thought yeah. they were. Oh, okay. But the other ones, did we ever? figure out a reason no, the, why they weren't they fell out of the public domain no these are in public domain they just never like I, right but the yeah. four we watched is there a reason yeah they just basically just it doesn't it kind of seems like they, they just forgot <laughs> like they don't be like yeah so and so didn't put in the right paperwork <laughs> yeah um because Someone something <laughs> yeah because yeah. some Probably sometimes not. with some <laughs> movies they said like um they, I forget what movie I saw that I was surprised that I was on public domain. It's a Wonderful Life. Is Maybe that it? it was. Or are you talking and... about Night of the Living Dead? Because that one's also. Oh, yeah. No, that one didn't. It was like more of a story. Like they just filed it wrong, and they never like double checked to make sure the paperwork went in. I think that was Night of the, Night of the Living, Living Dead. Dead. Was they that either mm-hmm. forgot to apply for the copyright or they incorrectly yeah. applied for it? But either way, like no copyright was really submitted so which is right. why you see that movie like like everywhere <laughs> it's in the background of like every other horror movie right they're always playing night of the living dead <laughs> uh the original and uh yeah um same thing for um uh it's a wonderful life it became like a big christmas movie because someone forgot to file for it and they could play it free on uh i think ted turner bought it and was playing it on turner classic movies like back in the 80s when he was really pushing for movies on tv and that ended up you know becoming like a holiday big holiday movie even though no one cared about it before then yeah and like all these episodes came from season two which 
I couldn't figure out why. So they had to individually copyright all the C, all these episodes. But when it got later in the series, they didn't have to individually copyright it because they just tacked on since the first seasons were copyrighted. It was like not grandfathered in, but it was like coming from the first season. So that's why the latest seasons, they can just do a whole season. So I don't know what kind of law changed for it. But yeah, these five and these weren't like I also thought like I knew they came from season two and I was looking at the order. I'm like, oh, there's probably like one guy I forgot to do it for a whole month. <laughs> and like these were scattered being released throughout the whole um, season. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like all right, somebody forgot one time to do all of them. Like it looked like throughout the year they this. Oh, forget this one. Oh, forget this one. Like, it wasn't like back to back episodes. Well, how many episodes are there in a season? Like, how many were there in season two? So, for th this series, it was 32. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. That's, that's a lot more than they kind of do now. Uh, yeah. Wow. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I I guess, I mean, there's something we can talk about later, but it does not seem like uh, the production of this show was uh, super difficult uh, on the technical side of things. No, and I couldn't find with this one um how often they filmed it either mm -hmm. so i don't know if they filmed like one right after another and just banged out a whole month because mm -hmm. like with most tv series they'll film take a little break and then when they take a break it's like during christmas break so like networks know like all right no one's gonna be home watching it why back then there was only three stations and there wasn't anything to watch. So I think that's why they put so many episodes mm -hmm. in, which Dick Van Dyke was on um, CBS, okay. which it ran from uh, October 3rd, 60, 1961 to June 1st, 1960. But if you saw our, um, the old time TV show, I kind of um, said in the outro of the that, uh, really, it was going to get canceled after the pilot. Mm -hmm. Like they didn't like the some like the the studio really didn't like some of the names and how it was directed. So they were going to cancel it. But the big sponsor, Proper and Gamble, was like, "All right, if you cancel it, we're going to pull all of our money." Mm -hmm. So they're like, "All right, we'll keep it." And had to kind of rewrite some of the stuff, like Dick Van Dyke's character. Um. I'm going to say it the way it originally was. So they had to rewrite it because originally his, his name was Petrie. So it was like Petrie dish. So mm -hmm. they didn't like that. So they had to like reword it a little different <laughs> to make sense. It's so funny when you, you see like studio notes from like the 1940s, 50s, 60s. And it's just like, it's they get caught up on like the smallest little yeah, details right. all like, the time. Like, was that the biggest problem with the show? Was his name? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess like it's like in Psycho how pe like people were in an uproar over them just showing a toilet flush. Like yeah, studios was... had the weirdest critiques and issues. Well, that was a haze code thing, wasn't it? The toilet, I believe you that couldn't was... show toilets, and yeah. I think it also shows an unmarried couple in the same bedroom, which was also a big haze code thing at the time, I believe, but we're talking about movies right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> Back to television. But yeah, but with uh, Dick Van Dyke, uh, they it almost got canceled. And it wasn't until the third episode of the second season where uh, they renewed it for several more uh, seasons, but it broke into the top 10 uh, TV series, beating out the Bellevue Hillbillies, which was the number one show at the time. Which is wild. I was looking into that after I saw it. And the Procter and Gamble, they're just a healthcare company. Yeah. Like they a random company to be really in on Dick Van Dyke show, you know? But I think they also had um a lot of shows that they sponsored. Like they had like four or five soap operas on CBS at the time. And they said if they pulled Dick Van Dyke that they would cancel sponsoring for everything. Yeah. So CBS would be just out of content, basically. So I had to. Was yeah. there a particular reason why they were so invested in the Dick Van Dyke show? Because it seems like they really like put their foot down when the studio was threatening to cancel it. Right. I know that they were a, like a big sponsor, but I don't know. They must have just loved the show. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, they must. Yeah. But, they um, must have saw something. Either that or because at the time, most of the stars, that was their first like TV series being in. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until after that they started going 
into movies. Um, well, Dick Van Dyke was he like his character in the show. He started out as a sketch comedy writer, I think. Right? Yeah, mm-hmm. with the guy who like the showrunner who created the show. They were like co-workers, and then uh, what's his name? What's uh, the... Carl Reiner? Carl yeah, Reiner, Carl yeah. Reiner. Is that Rob Reiner's dad? Oh. No. Yeah, and then I think I, I actually think it... I think I actually read that originally. Carl Reiner wanted to play the lead role. But a studio executive had an issue with that. I, I, I don't know exactly why. So they recasted with Dick Van Dyke in the lead role. That kind of make. I mean, I I guess this is a as good a point as any to go into that. I I feel like probably the best asset the show has is it does have a really good cast, except except for the kid. Yeah, well... that is a very <laughs> bad child actor. Um, oh yeah, uh, he... child actors back in the. Old TV shows were not the, uh, they weren't the best, even to today, say the but least. Back then, crazy. Yeah. But yeah, Carl Rainier, even when he was making um, Rob, everything he did, he based off himself. So he was a mm-hmm. comedy writer in New York with a wife and a kids. Um, so I think it's pretty crazy. Like that was him, um, you know. And even the neighborhood he grew up in, which they kind of renamed the street Dick Van Dyke Street because he lived on the street. You you look at it, it's just the suburbia neighborhood and everything else so a lot of it was based like i think i forget which character was he based one of his neighbors off of so it's kind of like uh, larry david with seinfeld right (laughs) yeah like george off of himself and uh, kramer was based on someone he knew yeah Mm -hmm. well the whole show actually was life experiences like every episode they said you know car randy you're kind of just asked cast and crew for like life experiences that's almost how they got every story so everything it's pretty cool everything's almost like a true story you know obviously embellished and made for tv but each is like situation that you see you notice it because it's all just like real life situations that you know get a little tricky but that's kind of how he would come up with them it's just things that happen to them you know? oh yeah, yeah yeah like every storyline between the husband and wife you can tell is like oh this is an argument that the husband and wife gets into but like one of the episodes <laughs> is uh the bank book is mm-hmm. like like i had to look up because i'm like i couldn't know like if every episode was in front of a live audience because the beginning of it that you see is the true version of what happened i was like they just had like people laughing i was like this is like awkward spot for people to laugh i'm like this is probably a laugh track and i looked it up and really every episode was in front of a audience the only ones that weren't there was four that weren't there was one they filmed four days after jfk got shot Mm -hmm. so they didn't have a crew they didn't have an audience then um they had to do another episode that they had to keep going back and forth with flashbacks so they couldn't have an audience in there why they were missing part of the show to really understand the joke because the episode was doing going to previous episodes for flashbacks so they said all right we're not going to have an audience because they won't really understand the episode Mm -hmm. they filmed on a live um they went on a trip or they went to some so it wasn't in the studio they went somewhere else to film and then um i think it was a live i don't have it there was one more that they they were either filming it live or they were doing part of the show in one studio and then had to go to another studio to finish shooting it. So they didn't want the the crowd to go from one area to another. But everything else was in front of a live studio audience. So for them to like laugh at it, I was like, they probably really was pushing that button to be like, you got to laugh at this. <laughs> you know, like they're arguing over like the most random things. Well, I... I actually, I felt that episode you mentioned Seinfeld earlier, that Mm -hmm. felt like very Seinfeld-y, especially like it it starts on this very basic kind of misunderstanding and then it has the element of he's the sketch comedy writer and then he's bringing his real life into the, uh, into his writing, uh, which doesn't really come up. I expected that to be an element that came up more and it really didn't, but uh, that's kind of like how Seinfeld will like, um, bookend it with his comedy performances that are like based on what happens in the episode and then uh 
But yeah, I, I enjoyed that episode, honestly. It felt almost like kind of cringe comedy, like almost <laughs> like what we'd have in like the late 90s, early 2000s, that right. kind of like really awkward, like weird comedy. It was approaching that more than like the uh, the kind of standards 50, like chipper kind of comedy. Yeah, and I think it, it just it makes it more kind of little awkward because it's that time era. Mm-hmm. Like you can like look at shows that I've done in the 80s and 90s to be like, no, they were badger back. Like, like I was just thinking, I was like, yeah, show, shows like Married with Children, like Al Bundy would just come out with a comment like right away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, like you wouldn't get that in the 50s. And the same thing we talked about, like uh, filming, like they were had they had separate beds. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, what was the other thing? Like they had uh, the husband being like the breadwinner and then like bringing in the money and the wife didn't have anything. And just to show like that air, like mm-hmm. it's like whatever the, the husband brought in, that was really it. Yeah. So definitely show that time. It was definitely like, well, you can't really avoid like those kind of time tropes. You know what I mean? At, at the time. But I was looking in, in, in a lot of the writing, they, uh, Carl Rainey really wanted to exclude timepieces like he really didn't mention any current events or any slang anything that happens at the time because he kind of wanted it to hold up you know which it kind of does as far as sitcoms go you know it's still kind of like a regular sitcom by today's standards yeah yeah the topics that they each dealt with is still like topics that people kind of go through still mm-hmm. but yeah you could tell like some of the writing of it is they just kind of like the never name a duck they were saying like they have two baby ducks mm-hmm. and then they could only get like one adult duck so it's like ah we'll just write the duck guy killed the first one well that kangaroo must have uh <laughs> must have been kind of expensive my i that episode was very dated compared to the bank book in my opinion but uh what i really enjoyed about it is how the animals were definitely attacking the crew yeah. and the cast and crew in between like the takes so like when they're holding that adult duck they're kind of holding him out a little bit so he can't peck at them and then when the kangaroo comes out oh that, that kangaroo <laughs> wanted to go the totally different direction they did not that kangaroo definitely was attacking people like in multiple <laughs> takes and they had to like really they were they were they were, they were visual like visibly very scared Especially coming from the character who's like, I oh, gotta treat it like an animal. He's not a family, he's an animal. And he got he's like, This guy, this kangaroo is gonna take this guy for a ride. <laughs> who was it who said this quote? I forget who it was, but it's like, I never work with children or animals. Oh, I know what you're saying. Yeah, I know right what you're saying. It's not Spielberg, right? No, no, it was an older one. Oh, I don't right. know why. It's not. But you can even is tell. Is it John Houston? It might have been John Houston. I think it's John Houston. But like by today's standards, I mean, of course, you're going to do the best you can to get a kangaroo to do what you want. But you have, you know, trained film movie animals. Those seem like they were just wild animals. They oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I thought that was pretty funny. He they, knew, they like, just... a circus owner who, was, who rented him a kangaroo for an afternoon. He was at, on CBS Studios. I don't, I don't know what talk show they would have, that, like, late night thing. It was Carson oh, yeah, at this Johnny time Carson. period? I don't know if Johnny Carson was CBS, though. Johnny Carson now that we're on it, was actually the runner-up to be Rob. He was almost mm-hmm. Dick Van Dyke. You know, it would have been the Johnny Carson show. I don't think it would have worked as well, to be honest. <laughs> no, I, so with Dick Van Dyke, he was he was a stand-up comedian, and he did start off in news, and then being uh, he did comedy acts, but he was more of a physical comedy comedian. Mm-hmm. So you would see him like, um, the face expressions and being very um, animated, and mm-hmm. I think that's what sold off, like the uh, bank book when she's yeah. like going back and forth in the kitchen and his movement around the whole house to look for stuff and he's just flowing and it's still going through. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't think Johnny Carson could move that much. Well, no. I even op- notice it in like the opening when he trips over the ottoman. Yeah, it's just such a animated defined trip you know like i'm like oh that's really impressive it didn't just seem like a trip but yeah stuff like that all the animation and which yeah that trip is like well i did it in the the intro for the show but i looked it on season one was a little different um intro that they had so at the time 
it was uh, Mission Impossible was the big show. And their opening was they would have pictures, headshots of everybody who was starring in the, the show. So the first season was somebody sitting on a chair and they would say starring and they would have Dick Van Dyke's headshot, Mary Lee Time Moore's headshot. And Carl wanted to do something different. So him and the other writers were like, all right, well, we'll just have him coming in and getting introduced. And they did one take and Dick Van Dyke did his little trip and he liked it. And Carl was like, why don't we try and uh, you know, somebody asked like, oh, do you want to take another take of it? It's like, yeah, but this time sidestep, like don't trip over it. So he did the sidestep and they're like, all right, which one you want to use? Because we'll use both. So we'll just rotate, like not have it in order. We'll just randomly put not tripping it in it. And it got so popular at the time because it was, it was only three stations that people would start making bets if he's going to trip or not trip. <laughs> and then I think by season four or five later, he did another one that he sidestepped, but then he kind of stumbled on his feet and fell into uh, his two co-workers. <sighs> but you can tell those are different because they're wearing different clothes Why the sidestep and the fallover are the same clothes because they filmed it back to back. Mm-hmm. But what's really funny is like the intros like that, and at least the four episodes we watched, um, the Ottoman's not in that spot at all. It's like totally in a different spot. But yeah, he still trips over the step going into the closet. Mm -hmm. And the one episode that I don't forget which episode that he sidesteps, he trips over the Ottoman in the episode. Mm -hmm. So it's just funny that it's just like this one article, like one furniture piece just keeps getting involved in the show. And he, now, since like Carl just bolt off of his life, I wonder if he had an Ottoman that he just hated <laughs> and just drove him crazy that he just added into the script. Right. I'm sure that came from some life experience, just like everything else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's so funny. But even like them trying to come up with ideas for their sketch comedy just feels like like us trying to come up with show ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It. Uh, I don't know. It's one thing I think that's kind of interesting about the show is it's almost like every character takes turns being the idiot in the scene. Yeah. Like, it'll always go back and forth. It, You know, I feel like a lot of sitcoms tend to be there's this one guy who's just everyone, he's always the idiot in the scene. He's always the one getting kicked. And this feels like, I feel like that's a more modern thing to have it, like, be passed around. Like, it's always Sony in Philadelphia will do that a lot. Where, like, who yeah. there's always one person who gets to... To be like a normal, intelligent person in the scene, then everyone else is kind of dumb. And yeah. this show does something similar. Like uh, in the duck ep, not in the duck episode, in the bank book episode, when they're um, when he's talking to his wife, like sometimes she'll be like completely oblivious, and he's noticing everything, and then it'll reverse, and she's like noticing all his stuff, and it's like it's a lot more of a back and forth. Yeah, and it kind of works out with the both of them doing like it worked out with them like uh playing off of each other mm -hmm. like it wasn't just a simple housewife and a working man they kind of went back and forth with different stories and then like the one-liners going back and forth like uh what was the oh the bank book episode when she was like oh, i was trying to save money because my parents bought a car or bought uh she got her uh, her she mom wants, got his dad the extra room. The extra room, that's what it was. But she was saving up for a car. Mm -hmm. And um, he's like, I oh, don't no, we should just sell the house and get the car now. He's like, why? You don't want to be an old man driving around? He's like, no, I just don't want an old wife <laughs> <laughs> driving around in my car. So it's like one of those things that they just, like the zingers back and forth mm -hmm. kind of worked out them selling it. Yeah, the comedy definitely worked. And like the... Between, especially between Mary Tyler Moore and like Dick Van Dyke, there's so much chemistry. Like they do, they just work really well together. And I read that's what um, when they were trying to save the show, Procter and Gamble was like, "Listen, these characters, these this crew works really well. Just give them some more chance." And that I think it's perfect the way that they all interact. You know, especially them too. Yeah, what's kind of tough is like all these episodes that are public domain are all from season two, so you kind of saw. When the writers were writing the show, they all wrote that one season. So it's kind of tough to watch these episodes to know from season one to season two, like the direction it went. And, but I think for the most part, everybody 
stayed on through the rest of the series. Like I think maybe the neighbors might have changed, but everybody mm -hmm. at the workplace and at home, they probably changed the kid because the kid probably got <laughs> too yeah. old at some point to have six seasons. I, I, I wouldn't have minded. <laughs> <laughs> that that kid is uh not not great. <laughs> He, he's being like read his lines in between the takes it's very like uh, oh yeah typical like yeah the way hollywood was yeah they bring the kid out they do the lines and they kick him off set it yeah. feels like he uh but uh one thing i noticed the neighbor character in the uh the bank book episode it's very kramerish where he just kind of barges into the room well, and, and like Dick Van Dyke's kind of annoyed, but yeah. he's kind of okay with it at the same time. <laughs> yeah, that's a very much a sitcom staple, the nosy neighbor character who just shows up whenever they want to. Mm -hmm. The bank book and what was... Like, I know we didn't uh, show it on TV, but because um, he was the dentist, when it, uh, a man's teeth is not your own's teeth, mm -hmm. he was evolved a lot in that um, that episode too. Oh, the neighbors, the dentist. And... Yeah. Oh, okay. So, which was kind of weird. <laughs> like we didn't, we didn't have enough time to do all six episodes, so we only, so I only picked four of them. But that episode, he, he wanted Dick Van Dyke to go to see him to fix his teeth because um, he hasn't been cleaning. Um, but he never said where his office was. Mm -hmm. And then later in the show, he was like, "Oh, let's just go next, uh, go to the, my house next door, and I'll take a look at it." To, because he's feeling pain. So you think he's going to go to like his neighbor's like bedroom or something. No, he had his dentist's office in his, <laughs> in his house. house. His house. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, well, back in the day, maybe that was it. <laughs> Your dentist maybe. worked at home. Right. Well, I mean, if they're doing 32 episodes, like I feel like they're just banging these out. Maybe that was something that like no one caught and then they were shooting <laughs> that day. It's like, uh, his office is next door. Yeah. <laughs> How does he get to his office when they're in dinner? It's next door. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I don't remember too many, like I, I've never watched like every single episodes, but like during the hustling, a hustler going downstairs in the pool table, I was like, Oh, all right. Usually the houses don't have a basement. Like I'm just thinking like fifties era when like the modern home was just like, a, they just built like cul-de-sacs and it was just like the house. And that's what it was. Maybe you had a bomb shelter in the backyard, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that, do they I, say where he lives? I, uh, I don't remember. New York. Oh yeah. Like you mentioned the basement. I read that was actually the first time you ever saw the family's basement in the show was that episode Hustling a Hustler. Yeah. Because he even mentioned um, in the bank book doing like a separate room for him. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, all right. And he got one later in the season. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's it doesn't say New York City, but I believe it's somewhere in New York because in the episode of uh, A Man's Teeth, Not Your Own Teeth, to go see a dentist he um somebody else had a dentist but like oh but you got to go to uh western connecticut oh. so i'm like oh uh, and they're like oh yeah that is a little bit of a drive so i'm like all right he must be new york if it's if the top mention in connecticut mm -hmm. but yeah like he needed a dentist but his dentist the neighbor was on conf on a, like a conference dentist conference so he wasn't around in town everybody like i got a guy upstate i got down city and when they mentioned Connecticut, I was like, oh, it must be New York. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the show, even though it almost got canceled, didn't have, in only the second season, it won 15 Emmy Awards. Uh, and by 1997, TV Guide named it one of the 100 greatest shows. Oh, 50 greatest shows. It was number 13 out of 50. In what year? Uh, so TV Guide did this. Yeah, in what year though? Uh, ninety-seven. Okay, yeah, ninety-seven. <laughs> they came up with this <laughs> this list, but it won fifteen Emmy Awards. Um, and you know they were, they were always nominated. I mm. forgot how many times Dick Van Dyke was nominated for awards this, for this show. Definitely, yeah. acting awards kind of make sense compared to like other things I've seen from this era. Like. It's it feels a lot more natural and like less stilted than a lot of those uh, sitcoms in like the early yeah. '60s and stuff. Like, 
I don't know. They tend to like pander more towards like families and kids, and like I think the duck episode definitely leaned in that direction. But it seems like most of the time, it's just all the show seems to care about is just being funny. Yeah, it yeah. kind of just seemed like a comedy show, and it was. I was looking it up to see like when this aired, what they kind of considered it as like a family sitcom. This would come on at ten o'clock at night when it yeah. would air live, and I was like, "Oh, that's pretty wild for a late night show." It just kind of seems like a family sitcom, but that's definitely probably due to its more comedy than family oriented than the other sitcoms, you know. That and then like um, the producer when he comes in, he just gets bannered by the other guy, just making fun of him constantly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, that's." Can they have the, the, the kids start seeing that because they'll copy it and just blame the TV show right away? Yeah, I, wa- I was wondering uh, when I was watching the episodes of that a producer character, if the writers like based him on someone because usually in shows like the Dick Van Dyke show, Seinfeld, even Simpsons, the like manager, a producer guy who's usually uh, the butt of a lot of jokes, the writers usually base him off someone who they actually know. Like, I don't know if there was a producer who... Like who Carl really just disliked, who maybe he based this character off of him. But even that, like if you think like their titles, all right, the producer gets the show put together, and these are the, just the writers, and they're just, he's just making fun of the producer constantly. <laughs> like, I'm you know, like the producer can just turn around and be like, you know, I'm not gonna pitch any of your stories right. or any of your skits, but he just takes it mm-hmm. the whole entire time. <laughs> But yeah, it's the and each one had its own kind of spin character that it could almost tie with uh, with Rob the character. Like um, his writer was married, but he had like a totally different kind of marriage compared to Dick Van Tyke and Mary Tyler Moore. So like when they were fighting in the bank book, it was like, oh, that doesn't sound like a normal. That sounds like uh, less of a fight than I used to have, and just like on and on. And I think, oh, what was the line that he said? Like, um, when Dick Van Dyke was making a surprise, and he wanted to tell his wife something, and this, the, it, it was basically a game of telephone. Just kept passing. Who would call Mary Tyler Moore to let him know that he had a surprise? Mm-hmm. And his one line is like, "Ah, I got to deal with my wife. I'm not going to deal with his wife too." And like, you did, you take it. Oh, yeah. I just looked it up, and apparently, yeah, he is Rob Reiner. Carl Reiner is Rob Reiner's dad. Dad? Oh, all right. No way. I knew he was a nepotism <laughs> baby, but I didn't know, I didn't know to what extent. <laughs> and I didn't know that Carl Reiner uh, and Mel Brooks were, like, partners originally. Yeah, so Carl yeah. Reiner did a lot more movies and um, kind of theater stuff. Yeah, he's in, what? What's what's a race movie? Oh, Mad 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 World. Uh, yeah, yeah. I know he's in that, and then he's in a. I I can't think of what else he's in, but that's the one that I knew he was in. Yeah, so kind of doing this TV show, like even how it came up to be as popular is kind of surprising that he didn't continue doing it. Like the um, I'm forgetting his name, but the one who the writer that did Happy Days, <laughs> it was such a hit for Happy Days. He did. Like Laverne and Shirley, Mork and Mindy, and mm-hmm. he just kept on going with that same kind of thing going through. He also did movies, but like his TV shows kind of piggybacked each other. Yeah. Why Carl just really kind of just did this one, and I think one other TV series, and that was it. It was mainly all movies. Yeah, well, it could also just be his relationship to Mel Brooks, who like, you know, became such a significant film director and producer that yeah. maybe they. Based- Maybe their friendship came from like similar taste. Yeah, because even Dick Van Dyke, he left TV and just uh, did in, uh, movies because mm-hmm. he landed Mary Poppins <laughs> towards the tail end of the series. That's like 67 to 69. It's someplace in the late 60s, yeah. I want to say. Yeah, it was like right after. So this was until 60. What did I say? This one was until 66. I think maybe Mary Poppins was 67, but he did um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang like mm-hmm. around like 65, 64. Yeah. And he just started doing more movies after that. And he wasn't, it wasn't until the 90s that he ended up going back to TV. And that was just off of a character that he did. Um, I forgot what, a, what movie that he was um, just like a corner doctor. 
and they just saw how he dealt with that. So that's why he did that crime. Oh, it was for Dick Tracy, actually. Oh. Yeah, yeah. He was a court, he was like a medical doctor in that. And the way he did it between that, the medical doctor and trying to solve crimes, that's why he got diagnosed murder. Yeah, this is kind of random. Did anyone see the new Dick Tracy thing? No. I don't know. It was a, it's a apparently new- very strange. It's just it, he made it for the rights. Uh, there's a new Dick Tracy movie? Yeah, they released it on Hulu. It's like a full oh, hour oh, long new- thing that uh, what's his... Uh, I can't think of him. He's in my, like my favorite movie. Uh, <laughs> uh, Warren what? Beatty. Warren Beatty made it, and it's like made on Zoom and like weird green screen what? stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's on Hulu. I want to say, and it's what? I haven't watched all of it. I've seen clips, so and it's very strange. Oh, it's any. Who was oh. the Dick Tracy in the nineties? That was him. That was Warren that Beatty was Warren too. Beatty. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. he he was the producer on that. He bought the rights and owned it because I think he liked it as a kid. Yeah. And then. Yeah, he made. I don't think he directed the movie, but he was a producer, and I think he wrote it. And he's obviously the star. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's just there. All these guys are still around. It's kind of crazy when you think about it, like how how long these guys have had careers. Like Warren Beatty's been a huge actor since was Bonnie and Clyde. How he got big? Yeah, I think Bonnie and Clyde was like his first big movie. Yeah, yeah. and that was sixty seven. So like. We're back on movies. We keep getting the movies. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it just keeps slowly. Like nowadays, the way TV shows are, there's not too many shows that are strictly like you get one person and he just stays in TV and just does like at the main roles. Mm-hmm. Like you'll you'll watch like one. Like actually, what's funny is the the hustler and mm-hmm. hustling a hustler. I saw him. I'm like. I've seen, I'm not that age looking. I was like, I've seen him as an older guy. He I must have been another T. And I looked in his IMDb, and he has like over a hundred yeah. friends. Ellen, yeah, uh, everybody. It's always loves like Raymond. one or two episodes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's always like in stuff that randomly pops up. Oh yeah, a fun fact about that actor. I was also looking at his IMDb. He he was actually blacklisted during the Red Scare in Hollywood with Joseph and McCarthy, and. Uh, that appearance on the Dick Van Dyke show was the first his first acting role in like years, because before then he had been like kind of blacklisted. Yeah, really. Yeah, like so, it, like it was his appearance back on the Dick Van Dyke show, which like kind of got his career going again. So I wonder why that's why he never hopped out of just being like one episodes. He just like TV series. Like we could probably put him on this episode. We might get in trouble because he was because <laughs> of his history. So we'll just throw him in one episode. But yeah, he was in tons of things because you recognize him. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. just that face. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's guys like that that you just recognize and he's always like a side character in an episode. But like the main characters really they start off in a TV show and then go to movies or they'll do a couple movies and then go to TV. Yeah, they just can't hack it and uh Yeah, vice versa. Like they <laughs> right. just can't yeah. get that right hit of a character that or they get um labeled as a certain character and just stays that way and get stuck yeah yeah, you kind of get stuck well like who started in tv like george clooney yeah start uh denzel washington was a tv guy for a long time um a lot of like people now who are really established like they start out there Uh, also brian cranston yeah brian did he ever? I don't feel like he ever really made it to movies. Like they tried after Breaking Bad, and he just kind of like he did get an Oscar nomination for the movie Trumbo. And... Oh yeah, I forgot about that movie, which is about the Hueck stuff too. Yeah, yeah. I think with him, he just gets more well known into TV because they see his he his delivery with comedy is like a not a slow burn, but it just he takes the moments. Like, even when you see, like, a cast, like, Breaking Bad, and I'm like, uh, I think it was Jay Leno, um, The Tonight Show, was talking about it. And the villain on the show, he wanted to make his character seem more intelligent. So he wanted his lines to be proper English. Mm-hmm. So he was trying to explain that. It's like, not who killed who, it's who killed who. Yeah, it was, because uh, he's a comedy TV guy, too. Yeah. Uh, what's, the uh, Jonathan, guy who plays Mike. Uh, Jonathan Banks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, like, they're going on and talking about it. And he was like, yeah. And, like, who didn't, uh, what was, uh, who was the writer uh, that 
didn't want to change it. And then Cranston shows up and sticks his head in the shot and goes, you know, it's whom didn't want to change it. <laughs> and he puts back up and everybody starts laughing. Like, that's his thing. Like, even when he was the dad of Malcolm in the middle, he would just start coming out of like just his delivery on stuff with the kids and his wife. Another show that was like mainly about kids and wife and mm-hmm. dealing with a normal thing, raising three kids, but they put a comedy spin on it. Like, losing your kid in a random in the grocery store for a few minutes or the kid gets stuck somewhere i'm like yeah that normally happens so like dick van dyke kind of goes with that pattern like you get a topic of what people deal with and try to make a comedy spin that makes it feel all right that it happened to you Mm -hmm. yeah it's uh i don't know it's very interesting how uh Breaking Bad, it was a lot of comedy. And then before we started filming, we were talking about The Sopranos. Yeah. And I've been recently re-watching that. And it's it's almost a sitcom, I feel like, sometimes. Like, it gets really dark and violent. But I feel like, especially the early seasons, like, it's a really funny show. And I feel like TV has kind of shifted away from, like, being funny. And everything's, like, so dark and serious now. But the shows that made that transition, Sopranos, Breaking Bad, all that, worked because they were funny. Because they were working with a lot of actors who were really good at comedy. Like, Breaking Bad wouldn't work if Brian Cranston was not a funny actor and wasn't, like, giving a com- almost comedic performance. And it, I think there's a lot of similarities between him and Dick Van Dyke. Like, his physicality. Yeah. The it, delivery, yeah. Yeah. Just used in a completely different way. Did, did Dick Van Dyke ever try to be more dramatic, or did he always stick to comedy? No, he did some dramatic roles. Um, oh, it's escaping me what movie I'm thinking of. I'm gonna, it's gonna pop in my head. But he, his more thing is not so much comedy. I think because he was a physical comedian, so I think his being physical in his movement. So that's why it turns almost like doing uh, a musical style with dancing and everything else. Cause I feel like he flows more with that mixing in with it. So I feel like a lot of times that's when you get like Mary Poppins and mm-hmm. um, what he did for uh night at the museum, like a lot of that kind of physic physicality. I think he liked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 and if you st- and if you see videos of Dick Van Dyke today, he's ninety seven, but like he still like dances and moves very energetically, like how he did in the old Dick Van Dyke show. Like he still, like he still got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's like a big musical guy too, which I think comes across in his performance. His his vocals will go like up, like his speaking will go up and down, like in a way that's very like almost musical sometimes. And that kind of plays into like how dramatic he is, because when you're on, he was on Broadway before he ever started acting. But when yeah. you're on an actual like, you know, set like that, you have to be extra and over the top to forget for people to you know believe that you're really where you are. And, you know, that's definitely. You can see that a lot in his acting, that it came from, like, Broadway and, like, live acting. Hmm. Yeah, he hasn't been, like, I'm just thinking, like, he pops in and out, but he always... Yeah, he was in the sequel to Mary Poppins, Mary Poppins Returns. Yeah, which that, I think he was also, I don't know if it was Mary Poppins Return or if it was the first Mary Poppins. He was another... That's why I'm thinking it's Mary Poppins Returns, but I think it was the first Mary Poppins. He was another character besides the Chimney Sweeper. So the Chimney Sweeper has his name in the credits. But he was another character, and because he had to dress up as like being bigger and not recognized, uh, they redid his name with all the same letters, but it was a totally different name. He's the bank owner isn't he in the second one yeah i think in the original too he's the old oh, he's the old man they okay, put him in they, old man makeup and he has like a big that's beard it that's it's the first yeah that's why i'm like no i think it's the first mary Poppins. yeah so mm-hmm. if you look at the credits it's not his name in the second character i it's like some weird like european name but it's all his letterings for dick van dyke mm-hmm. but it's like this a two-name thing it's not like a three-name like dick van dyke mm-hmm Hey guys, can I make a weird? Hey guys, can I make a confession? Yeah, I've never actually seen Mary Poppins. <laughs> I don't think I have either. No, oh, wow. that was. 
I was a kid. <laughs> I was a kid too, but like that was such a wait. Joe, one of those you've movies. seen it. Okay, Joe's yeah. seen it. Majority I was gonna say, Mary yeah, I was gonna say it was one of those movies that Disney did the live action mixed in with a cartoon mm-hmm. and filmed it. It's kind it's, of that separate way. So it was like the technique was one of the first. And it's a pretty good looking movie. Uh, like I think aesthetically, it's a cool yeah. looking movie. Uh, from that kind of time period, it doesn't look as flat as you. I feel like nowadays a lot of movies like that kind of. They don't look so good. No, they don't like, put as much effort. Uh, what was the other movie that they did the same technique? Uh, Bed knobs and broomsticks. Yeah, mm-hmm. is he it also was, in that? Uh, no, he's not that. Uh, I'm thinking Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Yeah, actually. he's in that one. Um, that one. The girl from Murder She Wrote. Oh, uh, Angela Lansbury. Yeah, Angela Lansbury. <laughs> <laughs> he's in that movie, but that's they did the oh, same yeah. technique, but it didn't hold up because I think. They also use terms and everything else that era. So that's why I don't think Mm -hmm. that picks up. But really, like, back then it was just – you only had the three stations. So if they weren't – that, so that's it for the TV shows. So, like, Disney wasn't really doing TV shows yet. So that's why – that's probably another reason why some people did a lot more movies because it was more opportunity because it was more studios. Mm -hmm. Like, nowadays you just – you can get on a show, but your show can be anywhere and streamed, and it might not be on big cable networks. Right. Well, I was actually I was reading about this the other night. Um, it was a some streaming. It was a movie, I think, not a show. But the budget was like insane for the type of thing it was. It was like a rom com or something. The budget was like a hundred and thirty million dollars, which that's a lot. Rom coms usually, I feel like fifty, sixty, whatever. Yeah. And apparently, the reason is. They don't give you residuals no, for not streaming. Anymore. Yeah. But so like, you know, back in the day these actors would do the TV show, but every time they play the Dick Van Dyke show, Dick Van Dyke gets some amount of money. Now, you know, you don't get money based on stream for being on these shows, so I think that might be impacting kind of the decision. The move to streaming is in large part trying to uh take money away from these actors, and I think that might be why they're going towards movies more and more because like there's more money in it they're not getting uh kind of taken advantage of as much yeah now tv shows will start doing that more like back then with dick van dyke it was probably just dick van dyke it was probably like just the five main people that would get Mm -hmm. residuals like none of the other people now like some of these everybody gets it but like the main people get so much more when it's reshown so that's why I think there's like a gap. Like you'll see 60 movies replayed, but you don't really see that much of the 70s and 80s shows just because I think of this of the residuals involved. Yeah, that's when the unions, I believe, renegotiate yeah. in the late 60s or early 70s. There's like a big push, and I think everything kind of gets restructured in terms of how people are paid out. I think crew members start getting residuals yeah. on certain things. like extras it's not much I, I have a friend who was on some hbo shows and she like sent me a picture of a check for like 13 cents right <laughs> she got because that, that's yeah how many times and also this era it. like nowadays with technology don't get but like this era of tv shows you would used to see like call now to get the box set of the whole series mm-hmm. and now like because of technology and that you don't get box sets you just need to download or watch it for free <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, that seems like a very brief period, too, because the home media stuff starts in, what, mid-80s, kind yeah. of? Like, and it only, it, it only really goes for, like, 20 years or so, or I guess 30 years until, like, mid-2010s, and then it's all dead now. Yeah. But, yeah, you never really saw, like, so I don't know if there was, like, different kind of rights that some of the TV shows in the 60s, that's why it was more able to be used like that as box sets and really try to sell off to people. Probably. That would make sense. Yeah. But, like, coming out of this, like, Mary Lee Tyler Moore, she had her own show, mm-hmm. Mary Tyler Moore Show, which is kind of funny it's going back to the Ottoman. So, after the Mary Tyler Moore Show, the town I think she grew up in or the town that a character was based out of did a bronze statue of her throwing her hat in the air because that's what she did for her show. Mm-hmm. So because of that, where Dick Van Dyke's 
uh, neighborhood is. That's why they just renamed the street. So the town that where Carl lived in wanted to do the same thing, but wanted to have a statue that resembled the, the show and that would have a speaker and play the Dick Van Dyke themes show. And what they wanted to do was a bronze ottoman <laughs> and just put it there. <laughs> and it gained traction, but at the end, they just voted no. And they just like, hey, we won't do a statue. We'll just rename the street Dick Van Dyke Street. It would have just been the ottoman. No yeah, just Dick the Van ottoman. Dyke. No Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Which some shows done because the show Bewitch, I know um, it never took place in Salem, but Salem's a big witch area. So they have a bronze statue of the character from Bewitch riding on a broom through the moon. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's kind of like, I don't know, like nowadays people normally do bronze statues, but I feel like that era, that was a thing to do. Like we'll do a bronze statue of our favorite show. <laughs> of an Ottoman. Yeah. <laughs> like and, and so that, their thing was the Ottoman, not like Dick Van Dyke doing some kind of move in a suit or anything. No, it's the Ottoman. Yeah. Have you <laughs> seen the uh, Fonzie statue they, they made a few years ago in Milwaukee? Oh, no, just, just look at him. <laughs> can can yeah. we edit a picture of this on here so the audience ah, knows what I'm talking just about? Imagine what it looks like. It, it's amazing. It's uh, it's it's really wonderful. <laughs> yeah, and also there's the uh, Rocky statue. Yeah, yeah that one's right. actually good though, right? Yeah, I believe yeah. that's still up. But... No, that's still up. That's good. What's that's funny? Fun. Zoom in on his face. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine. What's oh, really no. funny with, with Happy Days, <laughs> like. That show it did take place in Milwaukee, but like I think, <laughs> I think in Milwaukee, I would think like just because of the way the intro was, it was uh, Laverne. Well, it was the same writer, but it was Laverne and Shirley because mm -hmm. they went through Milwaukee, they went through the brewery and everything else. Like I think like they're one of the few TV shows I can think of that went to like a really public area. No, Mary Tyler Moore did was never mind. Mary Tyler Moore was show. Mm -hmm. She was outside the building where the news um, station was, and they she filmed that scene. But I was gonna say most shows intros are always either clips of the show or it was something involving like their set, right? Mm -hmm. Like they don't do too much outside, and I don't feel like until Laverne and Shirley and Mary Tyler Moore show that that kind of kind of happened that way it was like tv shows were mainly studio shows like mm -hmm. they didn't go on scene to do an episode or to shoot stuff yeah it's interesting how uh you can tell kind of how limited the budget is for a show especially compared to nowadays like in the duck episode when he goes up to the son's bedroom it's just the living room <laughs> and they didn't really they barely decorate it like the wall is very clearly fake yeah, and it just has like four toys like hung up on the wall. It's like, yeah, they were like, uh, "We're not going to show his room all the time." So, <laughs> yeah, like uh, you mentioned the, uh, you mentioned like those like kind of like a budget issues, but watching this episode, something that did surprise me, especially for a show of this age in the '60s, there's a lot more like a camera movement than I thought there was going to be. Because uh, going back to Seinfeld, we keep mentioning it. Usually in Seinfeld, when one person walks from one end of the room to the other, it'll just cut to a different camera angle. Mm -hmm. But in some of the episodes that I watched, the camera would like move, it would follow them, it would like zoom in on a person's face or like the wallet or an item that was important. So there's a lot more camera movement than, than I expected there to be. And even with more modern, not really modern, but shows like Seinfeld and shows like that like usually it would just be one a static shot not moving yeah i think that that i think because moving camera that was a little more of a style of the time so i think like in that case they make the decision to prioritize the camera moves over like the sets and stuff and they're, whereas in seinfeld you have like a lot of sets some stuff i think is shot on the street for seinfeld yeah. like so they're they're prioritizing that kind of aspect of the show, whereas, like, in the Dick Van Dyke show, they're like, well, we're shooting one location, might as well, like, you know, put the camera on a crane or something so we can, like, move it in or whatever. Yeah, and they probably also didn't have as many cameras on set as, say, Seinfeld did, where they could cut to multiple angles. On the Dick Van Dyke show, they probably had maybe they, two or three they cameras. Had three, I was looking it up. It was actually yeah. one of, like, the first shows to have more than one at all for like a sitcom but still three. it only had three yeah 
Yeah, yeah cuz most sitcoms before would just be one angle and it would right. never change. Yeah. Just one wide shot and it would be like a play almost, which is Yeah. Yeah, cuz either that they would just reshoot, they would just keep rerunning the scenes over and over again yeah. to be able to move the cameras. Cuz they were shooting on were they shooting on film for these and then like digitizing it for broadcast or I don't exactly know the process so that TV was done in. No, so the 60s they would yeah, they would still do film and edit it that way and mm-hmm. then put it for broadcast. Because, I mean, that was through, like, I mean, even the 2000s, like, Breaking Bad was shot on 35. Uh, and then I know Seinfeld was shot on film for a lot of it. I think they might have used video for some of the street stuff, but I think the in-studio stuff was still film. Yeah, there wasn't too many. I'm trying to think, even in the 90s, with, like, Fresh Prince and, like, those that they filmed strictly in a studio with a live audience. Mm-hmm. I think they still did film. Yeah, I think it was just video until like the late 2000s just was right. not really there yet. But that's like another thing with just with the audience. Like in the 90s, they still did it. But like nowadays, you don't see live studio audience shows as much. No, that was no, everything's done. They when they shoot a TV series, it's almost filming like a movie like they're on scene somewhere and they mm-hmm. shoot it that way. Yeah, that I feel like that happens in like the two thousands, kind right. of like uh, Arrested Development, like uh, Thirty yeah. Rock, and those shows really move things to that direction. Yeah, yeah, because in the nineties you still had like uh, Family Matters, Step by Step, mm-hmm. all that. That was still the TGIF on yeah. ABC for, so they they still did that kind of era. Yeah, even Seinfeld like fakes it with the laugh track. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is the hardest part of watching Seinfeld nowadays. It is the laugh track. I can't get through the laugh tracks. That's what I kind of like the live audience because it didn't feel like a fake laugh track. You almost felt that they were real laughing sometimes. Oh, yeah, yeah. There was, yeah, there was a couple of scenes that you can just tell that one person that had the really loud laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was just tough to listen to. But that also yeah. made me think when I realized it was live studio. Do you when if you forget a line or mess up, you just rerun it back with the yeah. student. That's got to be so frustrating for the live audience. <laughs> well, yeah. it, it all probably would be depending on. Um, that's probably why the the son didn't have good jokes, right? Because he probably was messing up his lines so many times. So like the jokes just didn't deliver right. It's like just say the line. Yeah, just say the line and get out of yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and also depending on the budget for the show, they probably want to have as few takes as possible because having to re-roll the film and get more film to do extra takes is probably a bit expensive for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's probably not too many. And probably with those guys too, like some some shows when you have like a comedian on, they'll try to reword uh, a line or deliver a different joke because right. if they just don't get that delivery as they wanted at first. But I feel like back then, like they still had to do it line by line, so they had to make sure they set it right to get really that that pop of the joke to get the laughing in there. Mm-hmm. And it didn't sound like somebody was just hitting a button. Just yeah. hit applause right. and laugh. <laughs> All right, so we got uh, we're wrapping up this episode of the radio cast. So hope everybody enjoyed watching the Dick Van Dyke show. Uh, it's one of those shows that was kind of well known, so it's kind of surprising to see uh, it on the public domain. And there's a couple other series that are on the list too that will probably come across, um, depending on who's doing the rotation of it. So, but uh, this uh, podcast radio cast is more for a deeper dive cut of the old time movie and the old time TV show that we're bringing back. So. Uh, make sure you keep an eye on new coming episodes and just uh, be on a lookout of uh, what we have here for the episode for to know what to watch. So you kind of interact and come up with your own uh, description or your own thoughts of kind of what we saw and what uh, one of us picked out. So uh, next time the radio cast will have different panels on uh, different aspects of either the TV or the movie that we uh, handpicked um, to watch. So I like to thank Ben, Jack, Jack, <laughs> to, uh, Sean in this panel. So uh, keep an eye out 
Uh, make sure to check out um, all the other shows that we've done. And uh, if you missed anything and want to rewatch, just make sure you uh, look on eastandcat.org to uh, follow our YouTube channel. So uh, thank you for watching and uh, have a good night.